Hello Booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Book Heaven Books. This is my TBR check-in and wrap-up for the month of August. So let's start with the TBR check-in. I was good. I read three books of my own books. Now, I read a lot of books in August, but just three of them came from my TBR, the, the books, the physical books that I own and that I have not read yet. Um, I acquired four books. So that's pretty close. And I unhauled one. So the one that I remove is a book that I had taken in a little free library, a Daniel Steele for Garbagist. And since I did not read it in Garbagist, I figured I would not read it at some other point. So I decided to bring it back to a little free library. So the numbers are minus three plus four minus one for a difference of zero. So that means it, it leaves me at the same point I was at the end of July and I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Given the number of books that I read from the library and elsewhere, a, 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 a zero is a very good result. So hopefully in September it's going to be um, even better by being negative. Anyway, um, so the books that I read in August, I've already talked about some of them uh, in Garb August. For Garb August, I made a wrap up, so I will leave a link to that video in the description box. I also read three books for the Booktube Prize, and I cannot talk about them, so I'm not going to talk about them. And I read two nonfiction books, two new releases, and I wanted to talk about them a bit more, so I decided to make a separate video for them. So that leaves me with just two books that I have not talked about and that I read in August. And I'm going to add another one to that because, yeah, I should talk about three books in this video. <laughs> so it's a book that I read in June but have not talked about yet. So um, the last book that I read in uh, August and the first one I'm going to talk about is The Liar's Dictionary by Ely Williams. Um, I had heard a lot of, about that book on YouTube, on Booktube and uh, elsewhere on the internet and... The one that sort of pushed me, that sort of convinced me to read the book is Lindy from Lindy's My Pie Reads. The way she talked about it, I thought this book is for me. And indeed it was. It was just a lovely read. I enjoyed this book so much. Uh, so this book is about a dictionary. Uh, it's Swansby's dictionary. It was the creation of a Mr. Swansby at the end of the 19th century. He had used the family fortune to uh, have a dictionary written that would rival uh, that of Oxford and other famous dictionaries. However, of course, the task was never completed. And several generations later, we are in modern times and the descendant of that Mr. Swansby, another Mr. Swansby, wants to complete the task by having the uh, written volumes of the Swansby dictionary published online. So he's working on that. However, the family fortune has dwindled then to almost nothing. Now they own the building and that's it. So the company is reduced to that Mr. Swansby and our main character, Mallory, who is an intern and has been an intern for three years at the company. Her main job is to answer the phone and basically it's just threats uh, all day long. Uh, it's just threats by phone. And at some point, Mr. Swansby, who is working to publish online uh, that uh, dictionary, realizes that there are fake words in the 19th century dictionary and he tasks Mallory with finding them. So that is the current day timeline because at the same time we are following a 19th century timeline. We are following Winsworth who is the lexicographer who has created all of these fake definitions. So we jump from one timeline to another, uh, one chapter in the present, one in the past, one in the present, one in the past and like that for the entire book. But it's very well done and you won't get lost at any point. And it's just, I, how to say, um, I, I thought this book was very funny. The, the timeline in the 19th century in particular is quite funny. It, it's, it's almost reminding of P.G. Woodhouse. So if you've read any uh, Jeeves and Worcester, you will recognize certain things. Um, there's a scene at some point in a park with uh, Whitsworth nursing a hangover and there's a woman fighting a pelican. So just that already, you, you can tell there's something uh, P.G. Woodhouse-esque about it. So P.G. Woodhouse-esque about it. Uh, there, there's, um, it. It's a bit of an absurd situation, but it's just really funny. But it's not just the absurd situations that are funny. There's also the way it is written, I would say. that There's um, the... Um, the way the narration looks at the world, because a dictionary is a little bit like that. A dictionary is a way of slicing up the word, the world. So each word is meant to encapsulate a little bit of reality. 
and a dictionary is meant to contain all of these little capsules. So writing about a dictionary is also writing about the way we write about the world. And there was one passage that I liked in particular. Well, I liked many of them, as you can see. Uh, but th there was one that made me think a little more. Uh, at some point, when Mallory is uh, trying to find these words that don't exist, uh, she's discussing um, the situation with her girlfriend. And her girlfriend asks her, if you had to create words, what would they be? And she starts to think, and basically she comes up, well, she comes up with a whole bunch of situations that exist, but they don't really have a word for it. So I thought, a word for how I always mistype warm as walm. Silly things. A word for knowing when the pasta is perfectly cooked just by looking at it. Crucial silly things. A word for when you're head over heels in love with someone and you're both just burbling nonsense at each other, forgivably. A word for mispronouncing words that you had only ever seen written down. And when I saw that, I thought, yes, I need a word for that. It happens to me way too often. It needs a word. <laughs> A word for your favorite song that can never be over listened to. A word for the great kindness of people who unseen take care to release insects that are trapped in rooms. A word for being surprised by an aspect of your physicality. A word for the way that sometimes thoughts can sit unpenetrable but snug like an avocado stone in your brain. A word for the strange particular bluish sheen of skin rolled between the fingers. As you can see, it's full of inventiveness in the way of seeing the world. And this is not just in that passage. I find that it's pretty much all over the book. This way of looking at the world in a way that is different from the standard way of looking at the world because we don't have words for it. So I love this book a lot. It was a whole lot of fun reading it. It's not very long. It's about, it is 265 pages. So it reads in a couple of evenings. It's, it's just really, really, good. <laughs> Sometimes I don't have the words. Yeah, a word to describe a book that you don't know how to describe. We need a word for that. And then for, uh, well, not then, before, because that's the first book, second book that I read in August. It was for Women in Translation Month, and this is a book by Zoya Pirzad. I don't know how to pronounce that name. Um, this is an author from Iran, and that particular collection of short stories is not translated in English, unfortunately. And I'm going to say unfortunately because I really liked this book. I don't read a lot of short stories, but these one, they really worked for me. So there are five short stories in them, and they focus mainly about women. Four of them, the main character was a woman, one of them was a man. And it's about ordinary life. It is about relationships. It is about um, growing old together. It is about divorce and it is about uh, finding a house. It's a, it is about a whole bunch of things, ordinary things. And the reason I liked it so much is that for me, Iran in the domestic aspect is a bit of a mystery because I pay so much attention to the politics. Uh, so when I think Iran, I think the Ayatollahs, I think uh, terrorism perhaps, um, um, not so much today, but it used to be quite a bit. Uh, and I think about politics, basically. I forget that there are a whole bunch of ordinary people in Iran living a life very much like mine, with preoccup preoccupations very much like mine and things like that. So reading a book set in that country sort of helped me, remind me uh, that Iran is not just about politics. And it's the same thing for plenty of other countries that we may think of only as political places. This, they're not just political, there are ordinary people living in these countries too. So uh, this book, as to me, was a bit of a window into Iran. And the theme of the window was quite recurrent in that book. Uh, I think in every short story, there was at one point, the main character was looking out the window. And I was very much aware of the fact that that character was looking out the window. But by doing that, for me, I was looking in the window. I was very much aware of that. And I thought that was just wonderful. So I recommend this book a lot. 
So uh, because this video would be quite short, I decided to talk about this book too, which is in the same gorgeous collection as this. Um, this one is Love, Anger, Madness by Marie Vieux-Chauvet, who is an, uh, an author from Haiti. And I read this book for Caribathon, and I never talked about it, and it's a shame because it's really, really good. So it's a trilogy. Uh, however, the trilogy was published in one block, in one book. It was never published, uh, each book was never published individually. It was published in 1968, and at, uh, it was published in France by, an, uh, by a publishing house in France. And uh, the publishing house of France, they, they send books to Haiti and don't really necessarily ask many questions. And they sent a whole bunch of books of that author, that, that, that book, in Haiti in 1968. And the husband of the writer sort of realized that it would be suicide if that book was sold in Haiti at the time, because at the time Haiti was under the dictatorship of uh, Duvalier, uh, the father, because after that there was the son who uh, was also a dictator in the 1980s. But at the end of the 1960s it was Duvalier, the father, senior, um, and so the husband of the author just uh, tried to get his hands on every book that was sent to Haiti and prevent it being sale, sold and destroyed every copy just to, to make sure that they wouldn't be arrested uh, and his wife too. Um, officially the book was never banned, officially the author was never exiled, but in fact nobody could read the book and the author died in New York. Um, because she never went back to Haiti afterwards, after the publication, publication of that book. So officially, you could read this book in Haiti, in theory, in 1968. Uh, in reality, you could not. Uh, why? Because this book is about the dictatorship. Uh, it's never named. Um, it's, it's not about politics in a way, uh, it's about ordinary life. So we have three stories and the three stories are not connected. So there, there are different characters, different situations, different towns, um, they are not connected, except in the atmosphere. Uh, because that is the point of the book, it's to show how ordinary people, anyone, is affected by a dictatorship. So in the first book, Love, in the first book, the first part of the trilogy, Love, we follow uh, three women. Uh, the main character is the narrator, it's the oldest sister. So three sisters living in the same house. There's quite a bit of an age difference between the sisters. Um, the eldest is about 40 years old, the other one 32, and the other one 23, 24. And the middle one is married, and they all live in the same house, and the three sisters end up being in love with the same man, with the, the, the husband of the second uh, sister. Um, so we follow the relations between these three sisters, but we also follow the relations of that household with the neighbors and with the local authorities, uh, incarnated by one particular policeman, um, police chief, I guess. Um, and they live in a house that is a great house. It used to be because their family used to be part of the elite of Haiti, of that particular town, which is not the capital city, it's a smaller town. Uh, but uh, their father of the, the, the three sisters, the, he wanted to make politics, he wanted to be in politics, and he sold a lot of land to finance his political career. So the sisters are now left with an estate that is greatly reduced, and they have to live off of almost nothing. Um, they have to watch for every money, they get, every penny they, they have. And they have to be very careful because even though they are not really um, a powerful family anymore, they are still part of the elite of that town. So the new authorities, they, they still hold a grudge against this family. So it's about the relations between the former elite and the new very powerful elite. And that big house is uh, next to the city jail and they hear the prisoners being tortured at night. So there's this atmosphere of fear that is permeating this, this book, not just the first part, the entire book. In the second part, we also follow a family. This time it's a family uh, of a father and uh, husband and wife with three children. Uh, the elder two are about to go to university. The youngest one is handicapped, uh, is uh, disabled, and, um, and the, the, uh, the grandfather is also living with them. And they also have land right next to their house, and the new authorities are building a fence to prevent their to prevent them having access to their own land. Uh, so basically they are being dispossessed. And now it's the battle with the new authorities to keep their land. And 
in that one, it's 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 more violent than the first one. I have to say that throughout the book, there's a lot of violence. It's uh, th there's fear, but th there's also violence. And in the first one, it was behind the scenes, and in the second one, it is uh, very much shown on the page. Um, so the the family becomes divided in their strategies to get back to how to survive. Uh, can you really get the land back? Uh, do you just submit and recognize that you'll never get it and now you have to sort of move on? Um, so the family becomes divided into three factions. You have the grandfather with the youngest child. You have the father with the daughter and you have the mother with the son. And each of them, they sort of have different ideas of how to go about the situation. And the family ends up being divided. So it's about that too. And in the last one, which is madness, uh, we are following poets. Uh, we are not very much following them because they are hiding. They are hiding in um, an apartment, a dingy apartment, and they are not getting out because they are under the impression that they are being followed, that they are being watched, and they, they don't want to attract the attention of the authorities. And eventually it's their behavior of never getting, getting out of their apartment that gets them the attention of the authorities and they get arrested. And I won't say too much about it, but we see how certain people who you think are going to defend you end up not being able to defend you and even end up being the accomplices of the regime and how these dictatorships end up making everyone an accomplice. And yeah, I won't say more about that, except that again in this one, the violence is against, again on the page. So all of this to say that this is one of the most powerful books that I've read this year. It's really a punch in the gut kind of book, um, be ready. I think it's worth it. I, when I finished it, I was very happy I had read it because once again, it's a bit of a window into the ordinary life of Haiti, but this ordinary life this time is uh, in the worst of the dictatorship in the 1960s. And yeah, it's, it's um, full of matter for reflection, of thinking about political power, about uh, how, um, how dictatorships are slowly taking hold on everyone, how fear works. It's a book about f public fear mechanisms. Yeah, I think that's that. Um, so I recommend it a lot. It's, um, it's hard, but it, it, it's worth it. So that, that's the books that I wanted to talk about that I read recently, two in August and one in June, and I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you everyone for watching. I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine!